All right. Good morning. My name is Brian Money, and welcome to NAFA's April edition of the Advisor Ambassador Program. I work in the NAFA Home Office in the Business Development Department. Today, our host is John Hansborough from NAFA, California. Uh, John will be discussing exceptional prospecting practices. Prior to the beginning of the presentation, if all attendees can mute their lines and post any questions in our comments section in the chat board, I will be monitoring it, and we'll make sure that we have some time at the end, at the conclusion of our presentation for Q&A. Uh, without further, further ado, John, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Great, thank you. Um, hi everyone, good morning, or I say, uh, I should say good afternoon, I guess. It's not noon for some of you on the west, or on the east coast. I'm out here in Los Angeles and Santa Ana. Um, let's see, Brian, just to confirm, so everyone can see my screen now, correct? That is correct, you are, uh, you are live and good to go. Okay. Great, okay, wonderful. All right, everyone, so um, thanks for having me. So this is actually the second time I've gotten to speak to the NAFA Ambassador Program. Um, so uh, I'm giving my presentation on exceptional prospecting and business practices. So, um, you know, for all of us as younger advisors, younger producers in the industry, um, obviously a lot of the, uh, a lot of the stuff that NAFA older members will talk about is great things like advocacy and whatnot. Um, we just came back from Sacramento a few weeks ago for our state uh, advocacy day, and that was really great. But at the same time, for the younger producers, we need to be out there hitting the streets, meeting with people, and getting business done, right? That's really kind of the critical um, step that we're at with all of our careers. It's really the big inflection point that we all have. So today, I'm going to be speaking on exceptional business practices. And uh, a couple things, basically, start with some philosophies I have. Actually, I'm sorry. I'll back up. I'm going to start with who I am, background on our group, give you some background on my involvement with NAFA and what I've done over the years. I'll explain to you a little bit about my philosophy on prospecting and how I approach it, and then a couple of specific strategies, things that are actionable that I feel like you can actually take away with and uh, come away from this webinar with something to do, something you can actually work on this afternoon even, just starting to setting up some meetings and having some conversations. So, first off, a uh, quick little agenda here. So, I'm going to go over my background, uh, the LBL group who I work with, my involvement with NAFA, prospecting, a couple different things, get into LinkedIn and uh, some lists and things like that that I do. And then we'll wrap up and do some Q&A, okay? Uh, let's see, Brian, I just heard a ping. I mean, there's a message in the... Uh... Nope, no. Nothing yet, nothing yet. Got it, okay. Um, all right, so a uh, little bit of background on me. So name, John Hansrow again. I was born in San Diego, moved up to Los Angeles where I went to college. Uh, when I was uh, still in college, I had an internship with a career agency that uh, was, I was working for a couple advisors. They had a business that was focused on charitable planning, uh, estate planning, business planning for high net worth individuals, uh, mostly business owners. And so that was my introduction to the industry. So I started interning for them in 2011. Uh, in 2012, the year I graduated, I graduated in June. I got insurance license in May, I'm sorry, in July, so one month later. And uh, then I was a support staff for them for a few years. Uh, eventually, I started going into production myself. I left and went independent a few years after that. And then last year, I joined the LBL group, uh, an employee benefits and uh, overall insurance and financial planning firm down in Santa Ana in California. A uh, couple things here. So uh, first picture on the left, this is me, uh, Michael Morris, who's my immediate past president. I'm current president for Naples, Los Angeles. Michael's immediate past president. Uh, we're here with Judy Chu. Uh, she is a congresswoman from Los Angeles out in um, the, I believe, Altadena area, I want to say. Uh, so it's kind of a fun thing that, you know, for us, we're young people in the industry, but we've gotten to uh, meet, you know, politicians and be out there and doing some things like that. So that's kind of some of the stuff we do from an advocacy standpoint. This is a fun picture from our last national conference. Uh, me and a couple moderators and a few other classmates from my 2018 Lilly class. I'll explain a little bit more what Lilly is, but this was us out in San Antonio, Texas last year, um, having a little bit of fun after we actually had some professional meetings. So a little background on me, what I do on my time off. Um, I played college football and I'm still very active. So here's me with my girlfriend, uh, clearly being very focused on the game that I'm playing. Um, uh, so playing a couple different leagues out here, it's something that I still do to maintain a bunch of friendships, kind of part of my social fabric. And then I've actually had some business come out of uh, some of the sports involvement that I've had. So, uh, you can see here, won a championship with a co-ed team a month ago. Um, we actually took a typical California day actually back in January and we, uh, surfed in the morning and we went and snowboarded in the afternoon. So this is the first half of that day. 
And uh, just in general, you know, one of my big things is just go out there, work hard, but also have fun. So uh, this was us doing a little hike. Um, obviously, uh, we're not actually falling off a cliff here, uh, but this was a fun little thing that we did down in San Diego over Thanksgiving last year. So before I kind of get into all the actual like meat and potatoes of things to do, um, I want to start with my why. So this is my dad. Uh, he's a little bit of a goofball. He, um, I guess this might, you could say was a uh, 1970s selfie in some ways. Um, oh, let's see, Brian uh, just went back to a uh, camera of me one second. Um, so for me, my why, let's see, get back here. Um, so my dad, uh, so background on my dad, uh, my dad, John Hansborough, he was a doctor. He was a burn surgeon. He really professionally, he lives to help other people. Um, something that someone said of him um, years ago was that he gave much more than he ever received. And that's something that I really try to live um, really close to heart for me, right? Something that I really try to adhere to as well. Um, he passed away back in 2001. And so that was an early introduction just to uh, – hearing a little bit more about the family finances and stuff like that when you have a parent who passes away when you're young. Um, obviously, I didn't really know things going on at the time, but in retrospect now, I understand that my mom and him had had an estate plan, they'd had insurance, they'd had a lot of their ducks in a row so that if something like that did happen, then our family would have been okay, right? And that was huge because I was 10 years old at the time, my sister was nine, uh, my mom became a single parent and she was raising us and going back to school and having a career. She was a busy woman. And so having these things in place really made a big difference for our family and let, uh, let us continue to go out there in the world and do what we do and not have to uh, um, have a bunch of lifestyle changes or anything like that. So, you know, I'm living, you know, I'm a living embodiment of why we do what we do. So my dad's example of what he did in his life and then also how he had things set up so that when he wasn't here anymore, how our family would be okay. Uh, is a big thing for why I do what I do. Uh, moving on, a little background on the LBL group and Acresure. So the LBL group uh, actually has been a long time involved in a NAVA. Within our office, we have multiple past state presidents. Uh, we have a national president. We have a bunch of local leaders. And uh, the LBL group was founded by Larry Lambert and Debbie Lambert um, about 45 years ago or so. And a couple years ago, they merged with Acresure, which is a nationwide organization. Actually international now at this point. And so it gives us a really good combination of having a local presence of an employee benefits, executive benefits, and planning agency, as well as having the resources of a larger organization, right? So AccraSure, when you aggregate all of us together, we're one of the top 10 insurance brokers in the world. But when someone's working with us, they're working with the 15 employee LBL group down in Santa Ana, right? They're working with us. It still says LBL group on our business card. It's a really good combination of things. So we have the large organization resources, but also the feel of a small organization. Uh, background on me and my involvement with, with uh, NAFA. So I was originally brought into NAFA Los Angeles as the treasurer back, I think, in 2015 or so. So I served as treasurer for a few years, and then I started going through the uh, ranks to become president. And so I'm currently NAFA Los Angeles president, uh, and I've been overseeing us moving through the QME process and everything that's going along with that, which has been fun. Uh, in the meantime, I also completed the Lilly program last year. So Lilly is a NAFA program. It stands for the Leadership in Life Institute. And Lily is a program to help develop the personal, professional, civic, and volunteerism kind of leadership of people involved in NAFA, right? And it's a great program because it made me, obviously, I'm a stronger NAFA leader, but it also significantly impacted other parts of my life. So it was a great program for me. It really uh, helped me kind of find, I think, my voice in some ways for um, really, I guess, maybe not find my voice, but further understand what it is that I'm trying to do within the industry and who I am as a person and identifying my strengths as a leader and how I can utilize those best to help myself, help my clients, and then also be um, have an impact in our industry and on my community. So Lily was a great program. It's one of the best things I've done professionally, frankly, ever. So if that's something that's available to you, I would recommend you ask other NAFA members about Lily. Um, pretty much everyone that I've ever talked to about Lily has just great things to say about it. So uh, just keep that in the back of your mind. So getting into prospecting is what I want to start with is that first and foremost, right? I know we're all familiar with the analogy of an iceberg, but that I think is just so emblematic of prospecting and how our business works, right? So whether you are in a career agency, you're independent, you're working with whatever kind of situation you're in, um, 
I think it's so common, especially nowadays, that everyone sees the top line numbers, right? They see the results, they see the revenue, they see the commissions, they see the premium placed, whatever it is that your metric is that you're measuring. Everyone sees that, but people don't usually see the work, right? And so here I've just kind of broken it out, right? You're going to see the success of someone, someone get the new car, all that kind of stuff, right? The commission, the sales trips that people are going on, um, the awards that are being given out. But much more often, you're not seeing the work that's going into getting those results, right? Whether that is the rejection they're getting when they have a client meeting or a prospect meeting that goes poorly, um, all the calls they're making, all the rejection they're facing, all the doubts they themselves are feeling when they have a bad day, right? We've all been there where we have a great day, we have a good sale, we're feeling just on top of the world. And it can even be the next day where something comes up and we just feel like, God, where's our next sale coming from? Where's the next prospect coming from? Where's the next name going to come from that I'm going to call on? So I think that's the first thing is to recognize that there's work that's going to be involved with getting the results you want to get, right? And so we can't be afraid of work. Work is obviously a critical thing towards getting the results that we want to have and living the life that we want to live. Um, and I think just from a personal standpoint, recognizing that you don't want to fall into any kind of destination disease, you got to understand how you're going to enjoy the hard work on the path because there's no final destination, Right. Once you're producing $100,000 of revenue a year or people who are producing $500,000 of revenue a year, they're, they're always chasing that next goal, but they're not necessarily, I guess, embracing the uh, journey along the way, right? One of my college football coaches, I always kind of fall back on this up. One of my college football coaches always just said, embrace the suck because when we're doing punt drills or we're just doing gassers or whatever we're doing, that's like 95% of the stuff that we're doing for football. So it can't just be that you're excited to get that one big play on a Saturday or on a Friday night if you're playing high school. You've got to embrace the 6 a.m. list. You've got to embrace the film sessions. Like all that stuff is part of playing football. And so if you're miserable 95% of the time you're doing something, it's pretty much impossible for that 5% to offset what you're actually getting out of uh, all that other work you're putting into but hating. So you've got to figure out how you're going to enjoy the process of putting in the hard work and all the things you got to do for you to be successful. So a little checklist here. I wanted to run through a couple ideas I wanted to start with. So first of all is just being relentless. I think that's the biggest thing is that. Excuse me. You're not differentiator. I'm sorry. Are we supposed to be seeing your desktop? Yes. I have a presentation that's been up. Um, Brian, can you help out with that? Yeah, make sure you go ahead and uh, share your screen. Uh, it's going to be the uh, green button in the middle down there, and then you we, we haven't been seeing it the whole time. Yeah, make sure that you uh, make sure you have your slides up. So go ahead and go to the bottom, click share, and then that, should be that hasn't been up. There you go. There you go. There's slides. There you go. Got it. Okay. This it hasn't is. been up the entire time. It hasn't been up the entire time. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'll run through it really quick just so everyone sees the slides I had. So uh, a couple pictures I had up, you can see here, all that kind of the uh, congresswoman we were with, pictures from San Antonio or NAPA conference that we had. Um, pictures I had for some of the fun stuff. Pictures from my dad that I had mentioned. A little map of Akersher and our, in, our uh, footprints on the map of the country. And, uh, okay, got it. So here's where I'm at. So getting back to where I was, uh, uh, left off. So from a blocking and tackling standpoint, um, I think there's kind of just some basic things that we got to do, um, uh, for us to be successful in our position. And so, you know, from a top level standpoint that doing the work, it's learning, it's being up to date on our industry and our clients, it's having a process, and then it's having a toolbox. So first and foremost, doing the work. Um, shoot, so this one actually should say something else. But uh, basically from a doing the work standpoint is just recognizing that we've got to have an input in order to have an output. And so the biggest things I would really say there is uh, always remembering the 80-20 rule, right? For us as salespeople, we need to focus on what we're going to be able to, we need to focus on the activities that are going to generate the biggest results for us. So if we are like tweaking the corners of a presentation for, some, for a one client presentation, is that going to be as important as making those 10 or 15 extra dials for uh, our prospecting list, right? Focusing on where we're going to get the biggest ROI from the actions that we can have 
because in just my career, and I haven't been around that long, I've seen so many people who get so bogged down in the minute details of a client presentation or an email to that one prospect who hasn't answered that a lot in previous 10 emails, whatever it might be, it's really easy to get caught up in the uh, just the minutia that doesn't have a huge bottom line impact. So doing the work just means really being smart about how you're working hard. Uh, from a learning standpoint, you know, it's tough news if you're not really like, if you don't really like to lead, read and you don't really like to learn, this is probably not a good industry for you. Um, things are always changing from a task code standpoint, from an insurance product standpoint, from a carrier standpoint. There's a lot that's always kind of in motion. And so it's important for us to be up to date on what's going on in our industry, as well as what we need to do from a personal and professional development standpoint. And so this goes back to Lily because I think Lily provides a really good framework for how to approach your personal and professional development. It's not just reading the most recent nonfiction book that came out. It's not just reading a bunch of biographies, but kind of having a little bit of an objective in mind for why you're doing the readings you're doing. So thinking through, you know, if you're say, uh, whatever athlete you are, if you're a golfer, right? You don't just go to the gym and do a bunch of bench pressing, right? You're focusing on flexibility. You're focusing on your putt game, figuring out what it is you need to do to be a more successful golfer. In the same way for us, you need to think about how what you're learning is going to have an impact on you in your industry or on you personally and whatever it might be. Um, obviously, you go pick up just some fun stuff, some dumb stuff to read. You know, like Game of Thrones is starting on Sunday. I'm a gigantic fantasy nerd, so I've read all the Game of Thrones books. I've been on the Reddit. I'm really into that stuff. That's my for fun kind of reading. Uh, this is really talking about the things you're doing to further yourself in your career. And so... Within the Lilly program, um, some of the stuff that we focus on there includes the Seven Habits and uh, Good to Great, the Jim Collins book, as well as a few other things. Really, they're, they're more focused on helping you identify what kind of leader you want to be and what your personal philosophy on leadership is, and then helping understand the overall impact that leadership can have on your personal life, on your professional life, within your industry, and then within your greater community. Beyond those two books, which have been really great, um, the other ones I wanted to point out include Mastery, which is a Robert Greene book. Robert Greene is um, just a really badass kind of person. So I got to see him speak a few months ago, and he's written things like 40 Laws of Power, Laws of Human Nature, and Mastery. So this is my third book of his that I'm reading, and it's really been good. It's all about how you need to just approach your – you need to very consciously approach your development as a professional. So that's a book I think everyone should definitely check out. Other things include Obstacle of the Way by Ryan Holiday. Ryan Holiday is my favorite author just across the board. Um, Obstacle of the Way is, I think, actually really relevant for prospecting. Um, and here's why. So Obstacle of the Way is basically getting into the philosophy of saying, don't just avoid the hard things, but recognize that if you are facing some kind of obstacle, it means most other people in your situation are also facing that obstacle. And so if you just take a detour, the majority of other people are also taking a detour, right? So there's going to be a clogged lane trying to get around something and trying to find the easiest, most least resistant path. So what happens, though, is that a lot of successful businesses, they uh, view that obstacle as an opportunity, right? They figure out how is it that if I move this boulder out of the path, do I have an unobstructed path to a bunch of market share, to a bunch of revenue, a bunch of profits, whatever it is. And I think in a similar way, we need to approach our careers that way. I think sometimes, you know, people get so caught up on what's going to be the easiest thing to do, but recognizing that if there's some kind of roadblock for them, other people also have that roadblock. And so that just means there's that much more opportunity, that much more um, to gain from you figuring out how to get through that obstacle and turning that obstacle into an opportunity, right? So you might think of someone who... Um, has uh, maybe comes from some kind of certain background and feels like that's a disadvantageous to them. Well, there's a lot of people potentially from that background. And so if they actually make that part of themselves and part of their brand and part of their story, they might very much set themselves apart in a certain way, right? That might be a differentiator. And that might make them really stand out and make people actually want to work with them instead of the just homogenous group that all looks the same, talks the same, and acts the same. So that's a really critical book that I think really helps influence my own personal philosophy. Uh, beyond that, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Um, all of this stuff is always really good, um, really great reading, really uh, interesting. Outliers is all about, again, how people just become, you know, incredibly, incredibly good at what they do, right? The outliers, whether it's someone who's good at chess, um, someone who is really good at whatever they might be doing, Outliers is all about that. 
then the final one, um, he's just one of, uh, I think for me, like my favorite president, probably Teddy Roosevelt. Um, there's a three part biography series on him that was just fascinating. And he was a very big, um, he was very big on the personal development, right? I mean, this was a guy who was like a published um, bird watcher by the age of like 10 or 12 or something like that. Um, he had just a really interesting career before he even became president, right? He was like New York state commissioner for the police department. He was assistant secretary of the Navy. Um, he was a cowboy out in the badlands of the Dakotas. And then obviously, you know, he had his famous uh, San Juan Hill charge down in Cuba. So he had a really interesting background, but his thing was always that he always was reading. He was always developing himself. He was always trying to figure out how he could be a better person. Um, and then recognizing that, that was going to spill into other parts of his life. Um, staying up to date, that includes things like NAFA's government talk, right? You want to be able to understand what's going on from a legislative standpoint that's going to affect our industry. From a news standpoint for our industry, you want to know what's going on with different carriers, what's going on in Washington that's going to be affecting us, and then changes that are going on uh, there is huge. And then finally, prospects news. Um, you want to be able to know your prospects business. If you're going into a prospect and uh, Let's say you're uh, in a state that uh, just recently passed full scope of service or full scope of, um, of, of uh, work for nurse practitioners, and you don't understand what that is. And they're saying, well, we're really excited now because we can work independently. We don't have to work under doctors because we have full scope. You need to know what that is, right? You need to be able to talk prospects, talk and understand their businesses. And that's the only way that you're going to come across as someone knowledgeable who is going to seem like a trusted resource to them, right? So we need to be able to know our prospects and business as well as they do. Finally, uh, or second to last from a process-driven standpoint, you really need to understand what you do and how you're going to do it on a repeated basis. Now, I'm pretty contrarian, so I really don't like thinking that I'm just going to have an exact script I'm going to follow. But at the same time, you need to kind of think, okay, I've got certain checkpoints for a client that I'm going to hit, right? In a prospect meeting, I need to get buy-in for this, that, and the other thing. And how I'm going to move from those things to from stage to stage might have different language, but it's still going to be important to understand what process you're following and what checkpoints you're trying to hit in regards to a process conversation. Finally, from a toolbox standpoint, um, you want to be able to know your stuff, right? So if something's going to come up from a captive insurance standpoint, if something's coming up from an income tax standpoint, if you're starting to talk about dividend rates for a uh, universal or whole life insurance policy, you got to understand your stuff. Um, that's going to also help you under, help you create branding about what you're known for, right? So when a prospect refers you, obviously, or a client refers you, obviously, they're going to like you personally, but they're also going to have typically attach some kind of, well, John really knows, you know, 49A really well, or John really understands, you know, disability insurance really well. They're going to have something like that. And so you want to think about how you're going to be, you know, like what you're going to be known for in the marketplace and amongst your clients and prospects. And I think finally there, I would just always emphasize people and strategies are more important than products. And is what I mean by that is we've all probably been there where someone sits down with us and just is pitching specifically some kind of product. But, you know, in today's day and age, we can go on Amazon and buy some kind of knockoff or even, even the real thing and save money on it, right? Like we were talking to the other day, we were doing a baby shower in our office and you could either buy a product at Target for 40 bucks or get it on Amazon for 20. There's always a cheaper way to commoditize some kind of product. And so for you to create some kind of moat around what you do and make you very, um, create some, I guess, competitive advantage for your business model yeah. is you want to do two things. You got to understand strategies because you can always fit products to accomplish different strategies. That's always going to be a possibility. But then you also have to have people in your network, right? So if I've got better connections for someone than the next guy over, I'm going to be a more um, valuable resource as an advisor, right? If I'm always going to have that next great connection, that's going to be so much more important to people than if I've got access to maybe some kind of unique product that's really not that different, um, but we try to make it seem like it is. Uh, the next thing I want to get into from a prospecting standpoint, the things I think are really important are focusing on who, how, and why. So is what exactly I mean by that is answering a few questions. First, what kind of business problem are you solving? Or maybe it's a personal problem, right? I focus on the business market, but if you're focusing on personal planning, you really need to be able to answer that question really strongly. What problem am I solving for the person I'm working with? Second of all, you need to identify who is struggling with that problem. And you need to have a very good idea of who that is. You have to understand how you're going to reach that person. You have to answer that question. How exactly are you going to reach this person? Are you just calling people out of the blue? Are you creating some kind of list somehow? Are you, pers are you just only working through referrals? Are you still working through your natural market? What are you doing? And then finally, not just 
the prospect, but why do they want to work with you? Why, what's important about you? What's important about your brand? What's different about you? What are you going to do differently than the next guy over who has a similar business card with the same licenses? A couple things that I use in this, in this realm. Um, really, I guess the couple biggest things are really heavily using LinkedIn and then also heavily using, heavily using my edge. Uh, my edge isn't going to be as relevant on the personal prospecting side. Um, it's more of a business prospecting tool, and I'll get into that. Uh, but then as well, you know, just being up to date on changes in people's lives, especially if you're doing personal planning. If someone gets engaged, someone gets married, someone has a kid, whatever it might be, you know, in today's day and age, you're going to find out about that through Facebook, through Instagram. Um, you're going to find out about that on social media. So using these tools as a way to do research on who you want to work with, what's going on in their lives, how you might be able to help them, and then why they would want to potentially work with you is going to be really critical. Um, so again, my edge, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Reference USA, as well as Facebook. So for LinkedIn specifically, I'm going to go to two things here on the list side before I wrap up. Uh, LinkedIn, uh, the way I use it is I do a lot of advanced searches. So the first big one with LinkedIn, advanced search is what I call gold, right? So here's an example. I went to Occidental College, and I like to use that as a door opener for me with conversations. So from there, I'm going to identify a few things, who I'm trying to talk to, where they're at, and then why. And so as what I've done here, I've selected Occidental alumni, right, so identifying the who. From a where standpoint, I could pick if I want to meet them in Los Angeles, you know, because I'm from San Diego, maybe I want to click locations here and select San Diego. And then from a why standpoint, I've put in CFO here, right? So I know that I have a certain story to tell to a CFO for a business. And so here I'm going to click in CFOs who are second connection from Occidental. I've got a list here. You can see it says 648 results. Now, are all of those necessarily CFOs? No, but you know, even if just one in four of them are, that's, you know, 150 people for me to talk to. So you can see here, I've even sent some invites to some of them. Um, you know, I'm pestering this guy, for example. So it's a really good way for you to be able to identify people who might be a good contact and then obviously team you up for a really easy connection for you to make to them. So specifically is what I do with advanced search. When I do this, I'll send a connection, right? I might click this and say, hi, Doug. Um, you know, I see that, uh, you know, you're also an alumni of Occidental College as a benefits advisor with the LBL group, as a benefits consultant. You know, we work with the financial executives of the organization to help them get the most bang for their buck on their benefits spent or something like that. Let's connect them. So I use that a lot to start conversations and you know I've been able to drive business that way. Secondarily off of LinkedIn, the other thing that I'll do is if I'm meeting with someone is what I can do is I can, I've done this for example with Emily. So I type in Emily Cabbage, you know, Natha, Natha employee, and sort of search her, click in through second connections and I wanna see who does Emily know. The way I'll use this is that if I'm going into a meeting with someone, let's say I'm going to get coffee with Emily. And I look at this and I go, oh my God, Tom Michael, you know, I really want to talk to Tom Michael. He's a badass kind of guy. He's, you know, an incoming NAFA national president uh, in the next couple of years. I want to meet that guy. I'm going to, you know, print off the list, put his name on it as a few others and say, Emily, I would love to meet Tom. I've been trying to get a hold of him. I'd love to use your name to get a you know, foot in the door and start a conversation with him. Is that okay with you? And the reason this is really valuable is I think we've all probably been there from a referrals conversation where we're sitting down with someone. And we're looking at them and saying, okay, we had a great meeting. Now, before we go, you know, you get into your referral language, whatever that is. And how many times have we done that and people say, oh, I don't know anybody. I don't know anyone, right? That's a very common thing that I've heard at least so starting out where I try to at least see if people would be able to offer something. And you always have to prompt them with like, well, you know, who did you go to college with? You know, I work a lot with doctors or with attorneys, whoever it is. You're trying to always come up with things like that to prompt a name into their mind. This is, I've always found the easiest way because they don't have to think about it. They just have to say yes or no. And 90% of the time they say, sure, reach out to that person. 10% of the time they go, you know, this person added me and I don't know who that is. So do whatever you want with it, but I don't actually know them. So for the most part, I've never really had any strong pushback on using this as a referral language. So, you know, if you do this and you go into a meeting with three to five names, it's likely you'll walk out with three to five referrals from that conversation. Uh, Besides LinkedIn, the other thing that I mentioned I use is my edge. So here's an example of a my edge report I did. Again, I'm articulating who my ideal client is, right? So who are they? Where are they? And why do they want to talk to me? Um, what's specific about me that's going to make them want to talk? So what I've done here, I've done an advanced search. So I've looked into Los Angeles County. I've looked for manufacturing firms and basically pulled up this list of companies between 100 and 1,000 employees. 
So from here, this is going to give me a lot of information to start targeting into, you know, organizations that are having maybe some kind of problem, maybe some kind of overspend, what have you. It allows me to do research and then use that to start conversations with the ideal kind of client that I'm trying to work with. And I think that's one of the advantages you want to think about is that, you know, 15, 20, 30 years ago, right? We've heard the stories from older NAFA members where they talk about how they would just talk to anybody who could fog a mirror, right? That was always the joke. They say, you know, my ideal prospect is someone who's breathing. Well, nowadays that's, there's less and less, I think, permission to have that um, blase attitude about it because the reality is that the internet allows us to basically pick who we want to work with, right? Which is a very different um, thing that we just never really had 20 or 30 years ago, I think, in this industry. Um, and every industry is being you know, turned over because of this, is that we can go online and say, well, I really want to work with manufacturing companies in Los Angeles with under 1,000 employees. Okay, here's a list of those people right? That's a lot harder. That was a lot harder to do back in the day. So nowadays, you want to get very specific about what your value proposition is to a person in a certain industry, in a certain position, um, potentially having some kind of certain change within their situation. There's no excuse for not having that kind of articulation for your value proposition who you're trying to work with. So things like my edge, I think, are very helpful towards that because once you've identified that from your side, right, what your value proposition is, who you're trying to work with, you can use something like a MyEdge or a LinkedIn or a Reference USA to run that kind of list and then figure out how best to get in front of these people, right? And then the final thing I would say there about that is also thinking about it from a 80-20 rule again, right? You're always trying to think what's going to be the best way to move me from point A to point B and eventually to point C, right? So for us, it's starting a conversation with a prospect, getting that first meeting, and then having your sales process to potentially selling them down the road, right? And so if you can just generate that many more potential conversations, you know, and you just stick to your 10-3-1 rule, which is just, again, has borne out across the history of the insurance industry. Um, if you stick to your 10-3-1 and you're starting a conversation with three times as many people, it's hard to argue why you shouldn't be making that many more sales. So uh, my edge, LinkedIn, those kinds of things I think are great for us starting these conversations. Um, but I'm always interested to hear other ideas too. So please be, uh, speak up in the Q&A if you have any other ideas, things like that, that you want to hash out. So in summary, um, to kind of recap some stuff I talked about. First is just being relentless, having just an unwavering work ethic on what we're trying, on what you're trying to do, who you're trying to talk to, and how you're going about it. Recognizing we've unlimited opportunities, right? I think as younger, specifically younger advisors in this industry, we've got an old industry. And more people are retiring than are entering the uh, insurance industry, right? So because of that, there's just a complete lack of younger professionals in the space. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity for us as younger professionals to, um, to be generating opportunities. And I think just because of that, it's just a pretty blue ocean. It's just an awesome blue ocean for us right now. Um, and finally, just like I said, the who, the how, and the why. So um, with that, that's everything I've got. So I think it's time for us to open it up to a conversation. I believe there's actually also some chat as well. Um, guys, there's some things about Lily. Um, any questions anyone has besides that? Nothing in, the, uh, nothing in the chat just yet, but we did have a question about Lily. Can you elaborate on your experience with Lily? Um, just for everyone who kind of yeah. knew was a little bit late to join. Uh, my name is Brian Money. I do work in the NAFA home office in Washington, D.C. Uh, I am not a licensed agent. Uh, I am actually uh, sitting for my, uh, my licenses here in the near future, but I will be registering for Lily in my local, uh, my, my local chapter in greater D.C. So, um, John, if you want to give us a little bit of your perspective on how Lily helped, uh, just to, in, in addition to what you presented on, that'd be great. Yeah, totally. So, um as I kind of mentioned, like I'm a big reader. I always like learning stuff. But I feel like Lily was a great program for me to enter into where it created a bit more structure for why I'm doing the learning that I'm doing, right? When you're in college or when you're in school, you're studying for a particular degree, right? You're, you're taking accounting 101, then accounting 102, accounting 201, or you're taking like, you know, biology, microbiology, OCHEM, all that kind of, whatever it is you're studying, there's a path towards some kind of, you know, culmination, some kind of overall development you're trying to work on. Lily, I feel like, helped me tremendously from a personal and professional growth and development standpoint. And I think that's really important because as we look around, and I've had this conversation with people who are in other industries that are my peers, um, specifically a friend of mine who's an attorney, you know, I think if you look around maybe your office or your industries, the peers that you have in the space, 
you really kind of want to think about what you're working towards from a personal professional standpoint, right? And so we all know people who are potentially very economically successful in their careers, but they maybe don't have the home life that they that we want or what have you. And I think that the way to solve for that, right, I think looking at that and seeing that kind of obstacle, the opportunity there is if you're very conscious, you're very deliberate about how you're trying to develop yourself personally and professionally, you can uh, create, frankly, the life you want, right? And so Lily's all about that. Lily is a program over six months. You're meeting once a month with people from throughout your state. So you're going to meet other NAFA members, people who are potentially facing some of the problems as you are either within their uh, within their association or within their uh, work environment or what have you. So it creates, a first of all, a great peer network. Second of all, the programming within Lily is really wonderful. So what you're doing is you're studying different kinds of personal and professional development, business books, things like that. And then you're just discussing how those all that material is influencing the development of your leadership, of your ability to lead others and to have an impact on um, whatever it is you really want to have an impact on. And so over those six months, you're going to work on things like a business plan. You're going to work on things like writing out your personal mission statement, your vision, your guiding principles, things like that that are really going to help you zero in on who you are as a person. So then once you inwardly have a lot more security and a lot more confidence in who you are and what you're trying to do, it makes it so much easier to go out there and have a conversation with someone and to be able to understand, is this person an ideal client for me or are they not? Because you've been able to identify that for yourself inwardly. Um, you're not as much out there, for lack of a better term, like a chicken running around with a pet cut off, right? You understand yourself to a really good degree, and uh, you feel like a much better, you know, I mean, not you feel, but I feel like you become a much better leader. Uh, you've got a stronger voice. You have a lot more professional confidence. And, um, I mean, I'm a big proponent for Lily. We've actually then, uh, we're, you know, I'm still staying in touch with my late classmates, right? We're trying to figure out how we can do things to stay on top of these uh, conversations or these kinds of discussions. So uh, I just can't say enough good stuff about Lily. And John, yeah, uh, so a, little so talked, a little bit about what you talked at the beginning of your presentation. Um, Lily, for those that are, uh, that, that are not aware, um, we do offer uh, two major conferences. Uh, I'm going to mention a, a little bit about our, our congressional conference once we wrap up here, if there's no other questions. Um, and John, I believe we have a comment uh, saying, uh, is it possible to scroll back to the four questions listed on who, where, and why slide? And while we're doing that, um, we do have uh, our, our annual conference in September is Performance Plus Purpose. Uh, Don, John did mention that uh, at the beginning of the presentation uh, in San Antonio. Uh, we do have a Lily um, reception that we offer. So that's kind of something that everyone kind of gets together. It's pretty dedicated, invite only. Uh, it's pretty exclusive. Uh, so you kind of got to go through the go through the program, go through the institute and do the work. Uh, and that's, uh, that's something that's always pretty fun. So I've not been able to be invited yet, but it's always a good time for what I hear. <laughs> Brian, you got to get the invite. What's going on there? I, I'm sitting for Lily this, uh, this, this summer, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be there this year. But, uh, but to be enrolled in Lily, uh, definitely something if you guys are interested. Yeah, and those are the questions that we're looking for from Michelle. Thanks. Uh, but that, if that's something that you guys are interested in, uh, it certainly is something that we recommend for advisors at any point in their career. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly feel free to reach out to your local executives and see if it's something you participate in. Uh, registrations are live right now. Uh, so for those of you that you know, may be interested, just feel free to sh shoot an email and, um, and we'll go from there. Cool. Any other questions that we got? Any, uh, any questions about this slide, Michelle? Awesome. Awesome. Well, that appears to be everything. So, John, do you have any uh, anything in closing? No, that was it. That was my best stuff. Perfect. So, uh, if that wasn't good enough for you, then you know, sorry. Excellent. But I uh, hope it will hope it'll be good. <laughs> no, that was great. That was great. And and like I mentioned, uh, everyone, that uh, that's going to conclude our session for today. Uh, if you guys are able to attend our next session, it's going to be in in early May. So feel free to take a look at that. Also in May, we're going to have our congressional conference, which is our annual fly-in. To Washington DC. Uh, it is the largest fly-in for, uh, for advisors at any point in the industry. Uh, it'll give you an opportunity to meet with pretty much everyone that you would see you know, on a State of the Union address, all congressmen and senators from your respective states. So if you haven't registered for that, we do encourage you to do so. Uh, it is very low registration costs. Uh, it's about $100. It is in Washington DC on May 14th and 15th. So we hope to see you guys at the next session and, uh, and have, a great, uh, have a great week. Thanks. All right. Thanks everyone. Bye.